Thank you everyone for coming. I'm excited to be here. So I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes about creating your financial plan and what that means and how that works. So my name is David Ehrenberg. I'm the CEO of Early Growth Financial Services. We are a professional services firm that works with venture-backed companies. We have about 165 to 175 active clients. 95% of our companies are venture-backed companies in the technology space. We're based in the Bay Area and in LA, specifically in Santa Monica and in San Francisco. We work with, I have 42 people that work for me, and they are a combination of CFOs, controllers, accounting managers, and senior accountants. So we are an outsourced finance and accounting organization for early stage tech companies. So at the transactional level, we do things like prepare financial statements, pull together payroll, pull together AP. And then at a strategic level, we do budgeting and forecasting and financial planning and all the traditional functions that a CFO would perform. We typically will work with a client for 35 months so they get to about 50 employees and somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 10 million in revenue will typically exit right around a series C. We'll typically join our clients right after they close a seed round of funding or financing in the convertible note range of anywhere from 800,000 to 2 million. So that's kind of who we are. We've been around for about six years. We work with all types of technology companies, although our client mix tends to really mirror what the venture capital community is funding. So that means four and a half, five years ago, we had a very large number of clean technology companies, solar companies, and three years ago, we had a large number of social media companies, and today we have a large number of cloud computing and e-commerce and mobility companies. Some of our clients are Zendesk and Clout and Formspring. Sort of big, big names. Jobvite is another one of our clients. So that's who we are. My own personal background, so I started the company um, a little over five years ago. I have a finance and accounting background. I'm an MBA and a CPA. I started my career on Wall Street. I was a controller at Microsoft, and I was a CFO for two uh, different venture-backed companies prior to starting the company. So my, most of my background is in technology, and most of it is in early stage technology. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a financial model. I'm assuming because all of you are here, a lot of you are starting a company or thinking about fundraising or thinking about going after venture funds. And one of the things that all venture capitalists are gonna wanna see is a financial model. So hopefully I can help you to think about that financial model a little bit and think about the different components that you need to put into the financial model and the things that you need to be thinking through as you're going through that process. If any of you have put together a pitch deck, there's sort of the, what's become the quintessential, very common pitch deck that most venture capitalists are used to seeing now. It's typically 10 to 12 slides, and there's two finance slides that are contained in that pitch deck. There's typically a bottoms up forecast, which is taking your spending from the bottom and, and projecting it out, and there's a tops down forecast. We'll talk about both of those items and what they mean and what they look like. So when you start to think about a financial plan and a financial model, we advise not to go out beyond three years. If you're an early stage company, if you haven't started, it's hard enough just to go out one year. It's hard enough to even know what's really gonna happen with your business. To think about going out any length of time beyond three years is just unrealistic. 
And so we ask, we advise our companies to really keep it in the near term, to think about what they're going to have in terms of spending this year, and then to project that out a couple more years beyond that. The thing about creating a financial plan is it's a very good discipline. First of all, you're going to need it for fundraising, but more importantly, it's going to force you to think through your business. So it's going to force you to think through what's really driving your revenue. What are the key assumptions in your revenue? What are your key, what are the different things that you're going to need to put in place in order to sustain and create that revenue? What are you going to need to do in terms of hiring? What is your team going to look like and what's your team going to cost? What's the relationship between your hiring and your revenue? What are your development costs going to be? Are you going to hire people or are you going to outsource? Are you going to look for contractors? Is it going to be people that specialize in different areas that are outside of this country? Or is it people that are in San Francisco? All these different decisions are going to come to light as you're creating your budget and creating your forecast. And it's a great, it's a great exercise to go through with your other founders and with the other members of your executive team because it really forces you to think about your business and it forces you to examine the different decisions you need to make and it gives it creates a very very good dialogue so here's you know just some of the different things are provides a comprehensive financial picture forces you to evaluate key performance drivers validate your assumptions put your challenges into perspective iterations insight into the business model decision-making process, and the baseline objectives. Okay, so when we think about a financial model, we like to start with what are your major objectives? And I am a really big believer in setting up milestone budgeting. So when you sit down to create a budget, if you're a company that just is receiving funding and has no revenue, one of the things you really need to think about is, what do I want to achieve with the funding that I receive? And every time you do a round, you need to have milestone objectives associated with that. So if you're raising a seed round, and your seed round is somewhere between 750000 and $2 million, you need to have a very good understanding of what are you going to accomplish with that money? What are the milestones that you want to achieve? Every time you do a round, you want to have that same dialogue. That does a couple different things. First of all, if you, if, if you have achieved different milestones, that is going to increase your valuation. So it's going to make it much easier for you to receive your next round of funding at a potentially higher valuation. For example, if you come in, you create a C, you, you raise a seed round, or you create, you raise convertible debt, and you raise a million dollars. It's important that you're going to be able to show something with that with that million dollars. Perhaps you're a SaaS company, and it's creating a beta of your of your software. Perhaps it's getting your first couple customers up and running. Perhaps it's building out key pieces of your infrastructure or testing out some of your key assumptions. But each time you do a raise, you want to ensure that you're going to hit certain milestones with that. If you're a later stage company, if you've already raised some money, you already have some traction, maybe you already have revenue, you still want to think about your budget and your financial plan in terms of what are your key objectives. So if you've been around for a few years, you've, you've got positive cash flow, but you're sitting down to do a budget, you want to start out with, what are the top line objectives that we're thinking about? Maybe it's expanding into different markets. Maybe it's getting outside of North America. Maybe it's developing into different segments. Maybe it's creating new products. Maybe it's developing a new set of features. Whatever it is, you want to make sure that you start the budgeting process with those milestones and those objectives in mind 
because you want to build a budget that's going to ensure, or a business plan, that's going to ensure that you achieve all those different objectives. So major objectives, milestones, key assumptions. So you have an idea of what you want to accomplish, you have an idea of how much money it's going to take, or you have an idea of how much money you have. What are the key assumptions? What are your assumptions in terms of revenue? What are your assumptions in terms of hiring? What are your assumptions in terms of market adoption? What are your key assumptions that are going to go into this model that are going to be necessary for you to achieve your objectives? If you have been in business and you have historical financial information, you want to take a look at that historical financial information so you can do trending analysis. So you can say, what have I done in the past? Has that worked? Do we think that that's going to continue? Do we think that's going to change? And then your key variables. So once you create a budget, once you think through a budget, you also want to think about what are, what are the assumptions that could change? And you want to run scenario analysis. What if the market doesn't adopt it as quickly as you think? What if your revenue is slower to ramp than you initially assumed? What if your hiring is slower? What are the different variables that are going to have an impact on your overall market, on your overall model? Okay, so just the, the major objectives. I talked a little bit about that. Venture funding and negative cash burn. What do you want to accomplish with your next raise? Um, and, and the big thing with this is that you want to make sure that the next raise that you have is going to be at a higher valuation. So every time you're going out and raising money, you want to make sure that you're significantly increasing your valuation. And the only way you're gonna significantly increase your valuation is if you're able to have my major progress with your company and with your product and with your market attack. So every time you wanna do a raise, just think about what you wanna accomplish. Positive cash burn, no venture funding. Just what are the goals that you want to achieve during this period? Okay, so how do we go about creating a financial model? So we'll, we'll typically sit down with the members of the executive team. And if it's just you and a couple co-founders, that's the executive team. And we'll sit down and we'll say, look, what do you want to accomplish? What are the goals that you're looking for? We'll discuss it, we'll iterate on it, we'll make sure that we're all in agreement, and then we'll go back and we'll say, look, in order to achieve these goals, what do we need to do in each of our different areas? So if you have someone that's responsible for engineering, what do we need to do in terms of product development and in terms of engineering resources to achieve these goals? Someone in charge of sales and marketing, do we need to hire salespeople? Do we need to do inside sales? What type of marketing programs do we need to, to have in order to accomplish these objectives? The CFO or the COO should be thinking about what types of internal infrastructure do I need to build up in order to enable the rest of the team to do all the different things that they need to do. We ask each of those stakeholders to think about it. And they come back and we work with them and we talk to them about, okay, what are your hiring plans? What outside contractors do you need? What professional services do you need? How quickly do you think that you're going to be able to scale these different functions? Pull all that together and from that you're gonna be able to create a budget. All, <laughs> every time you create a budget, you're never gonna come in with, with the exact amount of spending and resources that you're looking for. So people are always going to want to spend too much money or to hire too quickly. And so it becomes a dialogue, there becomes a negotiation, there becomes a discussion between the members of your executive team about trade-offs. So if we don't hire this person, what do we have to, what, what are we going to sacrifice in terms of our timeline? If we don't spend money in this area, can we still achieve our overall objectives? Do we need to think about our overall objectives and do we need to maybe scale those back? But there becomes a dialogue, there becomes a negotiation, and it's part of this process that the budgeting creates. It creates this forcing function 
to create a discussion of how to achieve these different things. So the different pieces of a bottoms up financial projection, you're gonna start with revenue. What are your revenue assumptions? How quickly do you think you're gonna have revenue? What are the key revenue drivers? What does that revenue look like? How quickly can you scale the market? Then you're gonna look at your spending. What's the spending that's necessary for achieving your milestones? Headcount, professional services, contractors, any other types of infrastructure that you're going to need to purchase or to hire. And then just what, what are the different projects that you're going to be able to accomplish with that overall spending and with that overall revenue? Typically when you're doing a financial forecast for a venture deck, if you're presenting to VCs and you're putting a financial forecast in your pitch deck, typically what they're looking for is in year one, they're looking for a quarterly breakdown and then they're looking for years two and years three on an annual basis. They're looking for it at a high level, so there's two ways you can approach it. You can either approach it by departments, so you have, a, you have spending for G&A, spending for marketing, spending for engineering, or you can actually approach it from spending by drivers, personnel costs, contract workers costs, professional services costs, infrastructure costs. But they want something very high level. They want a P&L on an accrual basis, so a, a full profit and loss statement using gap accounting. And then also your cash burn during that same period of time, what, what actual money is going to go out. And they also typically want to see what your headcount is broken out on the model. So those are the components that they're looking for. Keep it very high level. I wouldn't go beyond three years. First year, quarterly detail, and then annual after that. The spending, the different pieces that are going into it. The customer cost details, what does it, get, what does it cost for customer acquisition? What are you spending to bring in new, new folks? Your human resource costs, so thinking about your payroll costs, also thinking about what are benefits going to cost you, what are your other personnel costs. You have some decisions that you're going to have to make if you're just starting your company in terms of how much health care you want to cover, what type of benefits you want to provide to your early stage employees, how you're going to set up your HR services and what those costs are that are associated with that. Consultants and professional services, I, I'm a big believer in with early stage companies, outsourcing your non-key functions. So to the extent that you can, really using outsourced resources in the early days. So that doesn't just mean using outsourced finance and accounting and HR, but that means to the extent that you can actually outsource development, doing that, as many non-key functions as you can actually go out into the marketplace and hire, gives you a lot more flexibility, it gives you a lot more options. It makes it very easy to turn and switch if things don't go well and you decide to go in a new direction. And it allows you to be a lot more nimble in terms of how you approach the market. And it also can keep your costs down. What are your research and development costs? Obviously, if you're an early stage company, this is going to be your biggest, biggest line item. This is gonna be where most of your costs are. If you're in this area and you're hiring engineers, you're, a special, you're in a special trouble. Just because, as we all know, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to hire in this marketplace right now for engineers. Another reason to think about going outside of this area and what you can do in terms of adjusting for that. Office and administration. This is just thinking about things like what's your rent gonna be, depending on where you're gonna be, if you're gonna be in San Francisco or down in the peninsula, or in another area of the, of the state, you can get a fairly good understanding of what rent's gonna cost you and what that's gonna look like. And the last is capital spending. Capital spending only really comes into play if you're a hardware company or if you're doing manufacturing. If you're a software company, an e-commerce company, a mobility company, most of your capital spending is just gonna be your computers. Maybe, maybe you'll do your own server farm 
maybe you will build up your own network infrastructure, but for the most part, your capital spending is going to be incredibly light. Now, four and a half years ago, when we were working with a lot of clean tech companies, that wasn't the case. And a lot of spend was going into, was going into capital, and that's where we were seeing a lot, of our, a lot of our budgeting dollars were going, and a lot of the VC money was going right into capital. Today, with what's being funded, that's not necessarily the case. So we sort of talked about this. Um, I have apparently jumped around a little bit, but we do base we, we do budgeting based on an accrual basis. Do, do people know what an accrual accounting is versus cash accounting? Can I just see a hand? So can you raise your hands if you know what accrual accounting is? Okay. So accrual accounting is accounting that's based on generally accepted accounting principles. Let's see if it's the way that you should be accounting for your business operations if you're a Delaware C Corp. And it just basically means that you're recognizing revenue when it's earned and you're recognizing expenses when you're incurring them. So you're not really worrying about the flow of cash and when money comes into the door, but you're worrying about when you earn your revenue and when you incur your expenses. When you do your budgeting, you want to do it on an accrual basis. That's what's going to be expected by the venture community. You're going to be reporting your financial statements on an accrual basis, so it'll allow you to compare your actuals to your budgets, and it gives you a true snapshot of what's happening with your business. But you will also need to have associated with this accrual budget a cash forecast of what you're spending in any given time. So there's some complexity around that. You want to be able to report your budget by major cost drivers and by departments. So understanding what your spend's going to be, but also what your spend's going to be in terms of salaries, in terms of benefits, in terms of outsourced folks, in terms of contractors, in terms of legal fees but also by departments. What are you spending on R&D? What are you spending on your general and administrative functions? And what are you spending on your sales and marketing? So if your company's been around for a while, budgeting's much easier. You have some existing data. You know what you've been spending. So you can do some trend analysis. You can say, OK, what have we done in the past? Do we think we're going to continue to spend in the same manner, or do we think that that's going to change? But it gives you a great baseline and makes it much easier. If you're starting from scratch, it's really, it's much more subjective. It's all about what you think's going to happen and what you think your spending's going to be. So once again, always start from the milestone perspective. Try and figure out what you want to accomplish, and then talk to the different stakeholders about what do they need in order to help you accomplish this goal? If our goal is in the next 18 months with this million dollars to get beta customers, what does our head of engineering need? What does our head of sales and marketing need? What do we need in terms of general and administrative support services? What do we need in terms of marketing activities? All those different things. And then, so, once you do your butt bottoms up forecasts, you also want to think about a tops down forecast. The tops down forecast is the, forec is the forecast that you use to create the slide in your pitch deck that basically says, what's the overall market that we're going after? What's the segment of that market that we think we're going to attack? and how much of it do we think that we can get? This is kind of a BS approach, and it's not a lot of use. But it's something that everyone wants to see. And the reason people want to see it, first of all, venture capitalists want to see it because they want to make sure that they're investing in a big opportunity. So VCs are not going to put money into an idea or into a company unless they think there's the possibility of a major return. So without the possibility of a major return, you're not going to get venture capital. That doesn't mean that you 
can't raise money from angel investors. That doesn't mean that you don't have a great business idea. That doesn't mean that you can't bootstrap something. But unless there's the possibility for the huge market potential and the hockey stick, it will be very, very difficult to raise venture money. So all this slide is doing is validating the idea that there is a large market that you're going after. So we'll typically see this slide, we'll see folks that have a major market that'll be a $15 billion market, and they'll talk about if we get 5% of that, or if we get you know 2% in the first year, 3% in the second, you know, third year, and X in the fourth year. It's all bogus, but you do want to think about it in terms of just validating the fact that you do have a major market. So top-down projections, start with the market size, identify the segment you want to go after, and extrapolate how much of that market you think you can get. So once you do both the tops down and the bottoms up projection, you want to make sure that you, that you gut check all of your different assumptions. Make sure that your salaries are in line with what the market is paying. Make sure that you've thought about things like recruiting costs. Right now, we're seeing about a third of, our, a, a third of the hires that our clients are doing are relying on recruiters. And recruiters are expensive. So think, think about things like that. Think about things like cost per square feet for your, for your rent and whether or not you've been realistic on that. But once you create your budget, go through with, with other folks that have actually spent money or with a finance professional and gut check all those different items. <coughs> reforecasting, once you create a budget, you want to make sure that you're reforecasting on a regular basis. If you just started out and it's your first budget ever and your company's off, just off the ground, you want to reforecast on a regular basis because a lot of your key assumptions are going to end up being wrong. <laughs> so you want to go back and you want to be thinking about it and you want to be iterating on it. And I would iterate on, on every three months on a quarterly basis. If you're a more established company and you've been around for a while, you can push that out. Maybe you're iterating on your budget every six months or every 12 months. And uh, let's see, final thoughts. The point of financial projections is to tell a story with numbers, a story about opportunity, resource requirements, market forces, growth, milestone achievements, and profits. Your job is to create a numerical framework that complements and reinforces the vision you painted with words. So that's Guy Kawasaki. Do people know Guy? Guy is, Guy is a complete character and sort of a, a, a larger than life force in this valley. He's also a wonderful guy. Guy wrote a book called The Art of Start, which is, a, which is a great book. And if all of you are out there starting a company, it's a quick read, but it's worth the $12 you're going to pay for it. And he talks a lot about what does it take to create your initial company, but also what types of things do you need to do before you go out and talk to venture capitalists. And I think this quote's great. I think basically what it's saying is, your financial projection is taking your overall business model and what you're trying to accomplish with your business and you're putting numbers around it. You're basically quantifying what you're trying to achieve, quantifying the cost and quantifying the opportunity. That's it. So. Do people have Questions? I think we have about 15 minutes. When it comes to the customer acquisition cost, is there um, sort of an average standard that it should be at? And if so, what is that standard? Or is there something that you continue to do? The question was, is there a standard for customer acquisition costs and how do you determine what customer acquisition costs will be and what the level should be at? It's very difficult because it depends on what your business is and it depends on what, your, what business you're going after. So if you're doing a high-end enterprise play, your customer acquisition cost is going to be much greater 
than if you're going after a consumer. And it's gonna really depend on what you're selling, what the market segment is that you're selling into, and what your cost point is, what your sales cycle is going to look like. It's gonna be incredibly dependent on all those different factors. So for you, if you're trying to figure out what your customer acquisition costs are, you should look at, look at your business model. If there's comps that are out there, look at those companies and try and figure out what they have done and what their customer acquisitions costs have been. If they're publicly traded, there's gonna be financial information that's out there that you can back into the numbers. If they're not publicly traded, talking to folks that work there or talking to people that work with those companies to try to get a sense of it and back into those things. How much time are they spending on each customer that they're acquiring? What are they doing in terms of marketing? What are they doing in terms of sales? Do so they have salespeople that are doing that work? Figuring out those different things can help you back into what your customer acquisition costs will be. Back in the back. Thank you. Um, by the top-down financial projection, uh, you say that they identify your particular segment. Once we have done that, we have to extrapolate the total potential revenue. How important is here uh, to calculate a market share or like doing a kind of a concept test or market test before showing those numbers and those costs <coughs> speak uh, to a potential investor? I don't think you need to do a market test. So I think what you need to do is you need to say, this is the overall market. This is the different, these are the different segments within that market. And if you can validate that, if you can find some industry analyst information that validates the market size and the segment size, that's worthwhile. So finding like a Gartner or a DataQuest or another industry analyst that has given different market information. Once you have the overall market, once you have the segments, then it's just a matter of saying, look, if we can capture 5%, that's what this would be worth. If we can capture 10%, that's what this would be worth. It's really, it's a bogus concept and a bogus slide, but you want to be able to say, there's a large potential here. There's a large opportunity. So that standard, I mean, it's uh, very used here in the US, <coughs> it's okay. Because I, I, I uh, have pitched in Switzerland, that's my, where my company is, and there is totally the positive. They want you to give the numbers with a button up, and you can validate, really, and don't talk about the hockey stick, about the 1% of the 10 billion market, and so on. So that's the reason I always the way here in the US. Yeah, I think people are used to seeing both a bottoms up forecast and a tops down forecast, where the bottoms up is really hard numbers, and it's got your actual spend and your actual pipeline revenue growth. I think the tops down just gives an overall idea of what the potential is. Okay. So I've seen both, I've seen both. I mean, I think, I think you wanna make it, I think on all of your slides for your venture deck, I think you want to keep it very high level. And I don't think you want to put too much information on any of your slides. So I think you want to keep it really top line on all of your slides. I think you always want to be able to talk about every slide that you have and have backup information on every slide, but I think for the individual slides, keep it very high level, keep it brief. And I think, you know, the, the pie chart or the bar graph, I think either one's fine. I think you just want to make sure it's visually appealing and easy to understand. So, so uh, beyond the, the revenue, the margins, the cash gains, do you, in the spirit of telling the story, do you also want to try to put a valuation on the company itself? So, I don't like to talk about valuation in a pitch deck. So I, I don't think it's good negotiation strategy to talk about valuation in a pitch deck. So typically the pitch decks, you're gonna be going through that when you meet with a venture capitalist for the first time and going through the different slides. I typically would advise you to not start talking about valuation until you're in the fourth or fifth meeting and you have a better understanding of what their interest levels are and you also want to have a good understanding of what other folks you have interested 
you're going to be in a much better situation if you're talking about valuation and you know you have two or three different parties that are interested and that way you can push your valuation up but I would avoid talking about valuation in a pitch deck I would avoid talking about valuation in a first or second meeting and when you do talk about valuation I would have a much more general conversation about it and the thing about valuation is it's not going to be it's not going to be based on some rational argument so you're not you know no one's building a valuation based on your net present value of your company or based on your future revenue projections you're building a valuation based on all this qualitative data that's very subjective So the question was about in, this, in the age of, a lean, of lean startups, where you don't really know these different variables, what do you put in in terms of customer acquisition costs and other assumptions? That's a great point. Because when you first create your budget, it's very hard, it's very hard to know exactly what you're going to spend. And you also know that what you're doing now is going to change. And it should. Because you want to be able to iterate, you want to be able to change quickly, you want to be able to, to move in a different direction if it makes sense to do it. And all those things are definitely true. So what you, you want to reforecast. So you, your, your budget in your first couple of years is going to be a living, breathing document. So when you have new assumptions or you have a new direction, then you should sit back down with your budget and go through it again and make new assumptions. Always keep in mind what the milestones are that you want to achieve, though, with those new assumptions. But just like with Lean Startups, you want to be able to pivot on a development uh, into new development, you also want to be able to pivot into new financial planning and financial modeling. And that's just going to, the budget becomes a tool as part of that process. Does that? And it's constantly changing, though, but in a good way. I think you could show that you're when you're going to hit EBITDA, um, when you're going to get to an EBITDA positive place, or when you're going to become cash flow positive, and you can talk about that. But I think if you're at an early stage and you're just starting out a company, I think the credibility of a financial plan that goes out five years is pretty low. I just, I, I think most VCs are just going to think it's the fourth and the fifth year, especially are somewhat bogus. I mean, the second and the third year, to a certain extent, are going to be somewhat bogus as well. So this is a double question. To start, when I'm doing my budgeting, I was looking at an FTE equivalent number. Mm -hmm. And I was showing it to an MBA friend of mine who said, if you put 200,000 pay for every FTE, the VCs aren't even going to question you. And you can go on to the next topic. But that is a lot more than we're expecting to have to spend based Can, we, can I answer that and then can we do the second one? Sure. And I'll come, I'll come back to you. So the question was, should you put in your actual cost assumptions around personnel or should you just put in a typical assumption that will negate the need for additional questions where it's something that you're putting in a number where it's acceptable so that you don't get questions on it? If you know your numbers, use your numbers. So first of all, I think $200,000 is a totally bogus number. 
right? I mean, I, I would I would never let one of our clients put two hundred thousand dollars per per person in for a budget. I think you if you if you know what your costs are going to be, you should put those in. So if you're talking about a software engineer and you're hiring them in the Bay Area, it's going to be you know somewhere between one ten and one thirty, right? If you're talking about outsourcing it and you're going to do some of the work in Argentina or some of the work in India or in Taiwan, then think about what those actual costs are going to be and what that what that structure is going to look like. If you're going to be using ODesk and outsourcing somewhere in the United States and you're going to be doing that at a lower rate, use those numbers. I think you should put you should think about your assumptions and think about how you're going to build your business and to the extent that you know the numbers you're going to do, use those. If it's going to be in the US or in the Bay Area, if you know the types of people that you're going to hire, you should be able to get a good cost understanding. I mean, there's enough startups out there, there's enough, there's enough companies out there that we have pretty standard costs. So you may be plus or minus 5% on your individual hires later on, but you can at least get a good assumption of what you think they'll cost. That, that 200 was supposed to be salary, benefits, office expenses, et cetera, et cetera, just as a high level. So you don't think that's Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I still think that's bogus. So the, the 200 was supposed to be salary plus all their overhead, all the, all the ramped overhead. So depending on what you want to do for benefits and what your benefit structure looks like, you're probably looking at somewhere between 18 to 24% overhead for salary. So you can, you can use, you can probably use 20% as a good number for your overhead for payroll taxes and benefits. So if someone's at 100,000, then you would do 120,000 for that. For your office supplies and your rent, I would bottom up forecast that. So I think about where do I want to be located? Do I want to be located in the peninsula? Do I want to be located in San Francisco? How many square feet am I going to need? You can average 250 square feet per employee. And then what are the square feet costs in those different markets? What does a service like yours cost for a company? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we don't work with companies that aren't funded. So we, we, we just work with companies that are funded. I would not use a service like ours until you raise a venture fund because we're not cheap. But we charge on an hourly basis and we charge at different levels depending on what the needs are. But our early stage clients that are pre-revenue where it's you know, five to eight folks that are just doing development, are going to be paying us anywhere from five hundred to eight hundred thousand, uh, five hundred to eight hundred dollars a month, and you know our later stage companies, a company like you know a Cloud or a Job Byte, they're going to be paying us you know four thousand to five thousand dollars a month. So it really ranges depending on what you need. So your assumptions for a seed round and for a VC are different. How are they different? Well, the expenses are both different seed round and versus a VC. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So um, if you're at an early stage, so there's a question about how do you do assumptions for seed round versus venture capital rounds. So if you're at an early stage and you haven't raised any money, and you want to do a three-year forecast, implicitly in that three-year forecast, you're going to have a seed round and a venture capital round, right? Is that what exactly. So that's a great point. So typically what we see is we see a step up in costs. So we'll see in the seed round, we'll see people will be working at a lower salaries and there'll be more of a bootstrap element. So we'll be doing things as cost effectively as possible. After you raise your first venture round, there is typically a little bit of an increase in salaries and some increase in other costs. And when you're doing your budgeting, you just want to plan that out. So what do I want to accomplish with my seed round? What are my milestones and how long, what's my burn going to be for my seed round? So how long is that seed money going to last me? And then once you get into the Series A, 
what are your new milestones? What are your new assumptions? What's your new burn? So you're going to have two different pieces to your model. That's a great point, though. <laughs> well, no. So the so the question is. So you're getting it revenue, but what if your assumptions aren't right? Yeah. What if your assumptions are wrong? Right. And how does that impact how much money you're raising? Yeah. Well, so your assumptions are gonna be wrong. So <laughs> if you haven't hit. Yeah. So I mean, so. Your assumptions are, are always going to be wrong if you're starting out a company, just because, as, as you mentioned, you're going to reiterate, you're going to change, you're going to make adjustments. You might not spend, it may be much harder to hire than you thought it would be. You may, your revenue growth may be much slower. So your assumptions are going to be wrong. You're going to have to change your information. In terms of your raise, you always want to make sure, understand what you think it will cost to get to the next milestone, and then build a margin in, right? So if you think it's going to cost you a million dollars to get to the next milestone that you want to get to, well then raise 1.2 million or 1.3 million so that you have a margin built in. So always make sure you have a margin. If you're spending less than you thought, that's great. That just gives you a lot more freedom and a lot more flexibility. That's a good thing. The, you, just why why I made that comment? Yeah, usually we like to see valuations straight up front and early on, and it's a prediction of that. Yeah, I think it, so. It's a little bit different. So I mean, the Angels Forum is a little bit of a it's a different organization than a venture capital firm, right? So it's a little bit different. I my my advice to entrepreneurs is to put off that discussion and to delay that discussion and to not have that discussion in the initial in the initial stages. And I think it's much better to get a sense from the venture capitalists that you're working with on what they think your valuation should be. And I think it's much better to talk to several different people. So the ways that we typically like to handle that if we're actually if we're going out and we're raising money with our clients is we'll have a conversation about what we're doing. The question of valuation will come up. It'll be a general conversation without any sort of firm placeholder put down and hopefully we can have several of those conversations so that we can try to get a sense of what the market is for our valuation right now for our company and then have that discussion. So you guys might be pushing your entrepreneurs to, to come up with a valuation and I can understand that perspective and I can understand why you would want to do that but for an entrepreneur that's raising money from a VC I think they, they should avoid it in the initial conversations if they can. Hold your cards. Hold your cards. Yeah, absolutely. Hold your cards. It's a, it's negotiations, right? And it's you're, it, you're basically you're you're going into a hardcore negotiation, and you want to you want to think about it as strategically as possible and be as smart about it as possible. So if you're raising money from an angel group, it's a little bit of a different strategy. Yeah, I mean, so if people are shopping for a service like ours, I'm a big believer in, in tapping into your ecosystem. So one of, the, one of the reasons why this valley is magical and one, one of the reasons why it's the center for innovation in the world is that there's this huge ecosystem that's been built here. And there's all these great service providers that are out there. I would talk to the people that you know and you trust. Talk to your corporate lawyer. If you've got a relationship with one of the venture banks, talk to those folks. If you have board members that have been around, talk to those folks. If you know friends that have started venture capital, um, that have started venture-backed companies, talk to those folks. We don't do, a, I've never gotten a client from direct sell. 
Every client we've ever gotten has been through a referral. Tap into your referral sources. T tap into those folks. I think Joyce is going to kill me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I totally forgot. This. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, Joyce. Uh, this is this is us. Uh, so we've got a big team of CFOs. We spend a lot of time talking to early stage companies. So if you want to talk to someone and bounce some ideas off of someone, you can always get in touch with us and we're more than happy to chat with you. And once you do get funding, we'd love to work with you.